I've been always delighted to return and see how the city has uh, become more and more adventurous and I'd like to contribute to the work of Max Morley and all the other artists in Galway for uh, moving what was an agenda around tourism to an agenda around art. And I think that is, that's really interesting over the years. Um, it began for me this discussion around the institutions that I've uh, either finished working with or are working with or have experience of working with over the years and turned into something that was more about a personal journey, if you like, because the idea of the institution is made up of individuals in the end. And I think that perhaps the crisis or the change or the demands around institution are often the demands around the individual working within. And certainly my trajectory would have been about encountering issues, crises, uh, blockages, delights, surprises, and uh, new directions while I was working that makes my uh, CV look like some kind of frantic hopping around in the end. So that when you're looking at the, the role of the institution, it certainly for me has been about moving people on or moving me on and um, looking for something new and becoming possibly a little discontented or um, finding that there is something that uh, I prefer to do instead. What is internationalism if it is not the assumption that the ideas and ideas and their objects must be part of a wider exchange? If curating art can be opened up to include the questions which artists are raising in their work, then we may be closer than we thought to surpassing the cul-de-sac of existing systems of classification. And over here on this paragraph, for each one of us comes from somewhere different, lives somewhere different, and moves in different circles. We are all part of this current socio-aesthetic transformation, claims the New York art critic Dan Cameron, and like Rupert Tiraban Vanya. Perhaps we too should pause, cook, eat, and talk for a moment, and forget the distinctions between the artworks and the world to which it must eventually return. Uh, those two quotes come from Clementine de Lisse's uh, uh, Free Fall, Freeze Frame, which is a discussion around a, a, a gaze, a turn of the Western gaze to Africa in 1994 for a major London exhibition in 1995 called Africa 95. And what I found interesting about working in an institution was the idea that what in 1994 London was doing to Africa was creating the African, the Western experience of African art in the shape of the Western institution. So we had the Royal Academy, we had the White Chapel, we had the Royal Albert Hall, we had everything going on in London at that time. And I, I worked with one of the devisers of Africa 95 at the time. And it was amazing, but it was very good taste, it was very good under a Fraser-like museum standards that were applied. It, was, it felt <coughs> might be very little to do with Africa. Now, Clementine de Lis, in this, this article, refers to an exhibition she curated uh, called Blotti, or the Transformation of the Object. And in that she brought five very well-known artists, like Mike Kelly and uh, Rosemary Trockel to Africa, along with African artists. And <coughs> her attempt was to try and shift the Western gaze. Um, but it was the beginning of this notion of um, how, how do we look at something that we don't know. Um, and, and I preface just my talk in saying that that's, where I, that's, that, that, that's the turn to Africa that I'll hopefully arrive at in this talk. So, my practice as an independent curator rather than an institutional director or curator was around commemorations and working through what was a, an extensive look at 1913 lockout commemoration, I found that the form that arises out of this contested territory which commemorative um, activity lies <coughs> in, consensus, consensus around that form is achieved through examining the battlegrounds and sometimes annihilation of the other is achieved. 
through those examinations. And for me, institutions arise out of this. So already you're in a kind of contested territory, but one where there is a battleground. I wondered through my examination of how artists can be involved in commemoration, contemporary artists, whether there was another way, and whether we think we can look at the past through the future. And while the battlegrounds might not yet be established, they will inevitably to become, but it allows us a certain amount of, of calm, if you like, or contemplation or reflection that artists, as I've embraced it, can be of their time and look at, at phenomena in that way. And what, revealed, what was also re revealed for me here was that within the institutions or within the ideas of um, various institutions around commemoration was that there were sites of scrutiny that revealed something of the times that we lived in. And in that way, I went on to the commission with support from the Arts Council and a number of other bodies, um, The Market by Mark Curran. Now, this is where I talk about the institution of the international stock market. Mark Curran is a, an artist whose practice is very heavily based in ethnographic uh, research and field work. And what we were going to look at was, in homage to 1913, the sites of the international financial crisis. He, uh, we identified um, the sites of the crisis as being global, obviously, but we had a number of stock exchanges in sight. And one of them was well, Dublin, London, Frankfurt, um, New York, and Addis Ababa. The reason for this was that these were emerging as pretty pivotal in our understanding of the marketplace. Um, and what, one of the things that came up was the idea of the narrative in the marketplace. And this work was shown in um, Limerick City Gallery of Art in 2013, which is called The Normalization of Deviance. I think this is a really good starting point because this, we know the market to be something of an institution in itself, but one that seems to be ruled by forces. And sometimes they're dark or sinister, sometimes they're just actually logical. Our stock market activity anywhere in the world is ruled by algorithms. And this algorithm is predicted 30 years in advance. So while there are decisions made now for 30 years hence, if something happens, the algorithm and the prediction of it just deviates and continues on a parallel trajectory, taking in what has happened, so such as the financial crisis, as a, something that it can take in its stride, but essentially just twists to change a trajectory. And this devi deviation becomes normal. Now, what we have here represented is the amount of data that one nanosecond of uh, algorithmic exercise on the stock market achieves is a six foot um, pillar of paper. This would be the amount for one nanosecond. So we, it is a huge uh, idea. It's not even a, 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 it's not impossible to visualize. But it is, in terms of an institution, able to take on something and just change to make it perpetuate itself. This came out of looking at, in the field, Frankfurt, New York, London, and Dublin. But in Addis Ababa, <coughs> what was very interesting, one of the reasons why we went there, was that um, the stockbroker or the stock market here, in a rethinking of what it is, what capitalism means, has the stockbroker making decisions that are related directly to the good, the consumed good, coffee, in the field. <coughs> Bethlehem here is the portrait in the Addis Ababa uh, Stock Exchange, um, which uh, access is very restricted. Um, to which access is very restricted. Uh, Bethlehem is train, a train stockbroker from America, from Harvard educated, having worked in the New York Stock Exchange, and has come back in a revolutionary spirit. And they would use those words to have the stock market in Addis, which is <coughs> recognized as a fast-growing economy, um, related to the produce in the field.
And as long as you have the stuff <coughs> related to people, you can have ethics around how this institution works. And in Addis, they see themselves as inventing their country's future and having a part to play in the post-communist era. I've used the word revolution, and we use the word socialism in this kind of connection to the, the, uh, the producer. But they would, the, Bethlehem and her, her, her colleagues would be horrified to think that they were anything other than capitalists. She sees herself as operating in the capitalist framework, but it is for the good of the country. And what the artist Mark Curran seems to have uh, uncovered here is a, an idea that the, the <coughs> definitions, the idea of what you mean changes and can change, but um, still Addis and Africa is working within an international stock exchange. So the idea of where institutions and definitions where they collide uh, and where they will meet becomes a, a problematic, if you like, that has yet to be solved. We don't know how Africa is going to work into the future of you know, uh, how stocks and shares operate. But take Ireland, for example, there's a huge trade mission to Addis, and it also has flights, direct flights coming from Addis um, in the, uh, starting in June. So there is a sense that Africa has a part to play in our lives, physically here. Uh, there's lots more about the market, but I just wanted to lay something of the thread that brought me in contact with Ethiopia and Addis Ababa as a place through this research. So there I am in Limerick, thinking in terms of Addis Ababa. Um, I was born in uh, Zambia in uh, a long time ago now, but it was when it was uh, part of the colonial system when it was northern Rhodesia and that country has disappeared obviously uh, is Zambia now but this also led me to think in terms of a uh, connection to Africa from this work that Mark Curran did um, in the field it, it, it does raise some of these questions about deviation from the set narrative the idea of technological advance and how it's perhaps ruling more of our lives and also the idea of the international institutions, of the international market, has, has um, absorbed the de definitions and has to contend with cultural contexts. And so for me personally, at that point, as director in Limerick City Gallery of Art, trying to think of what the future of that particular institution <coughs> and how it should be shaped, I began to think in terms of this type of question around my activity in, um, in Limerick. Uh, we were producing something like 10, 10, 10, 12 exhibitions a year with a voracious public around 70,000 visitors <coughs> a year and um, the need from a funder's point of view to um, sustain that audience, grow that audience, account for that audience and give essentially value for money. Now this idea about what the institution is required to do tended to become a mantra that I felt in the context of what the institution could do, should do, and the ideas around what individual artists were examining in the field uh, to be, I suppose, incompatible. I felt personally that, they, that I needed to change but also the institution was becoming perhaps a little bit, um, well, it was burning out, uh, <coughs> just in terms of production. So what does one do when you're confronted with that? You go to Africa. Hence, the idea of the very, uh, I'm sure you agree, clear Limerick Addis Ababa axis that I felt was necessary to introduce. I had uh, contacts from previous existences who were in um, working in Addis and um, we created a residency in Addis Ababa for a painter, um, an Irish painter, a Limerick painter, to go to Addis. And as it turned out, um, I, had, uh, uh, I did the international, the independent curatorial intensive 
which, peculiarly enough, was going to be based in Addis Ababa at the same time as this residency. There was quite a lot of strong activity around Addis. And again, here with um, Clementine de Lis, uh, the idea of free fall I, find, I found with my arrival in, in Addis to be, to be a very good metaphor to identify how I felt. So the impact of artists and their practice today simultaneously the charting of a new artistic and critical landscape interested me. I was hearing Clementine from way back in that. But um, the interesting thing was rather than decide that it was Africa 94 again, not 95 again, um, she wanted to approach it from an angle where ultimately the encounter and the work became the focus rather than the location <coughs> in which they take place. And I, I thought that was really important, that the institution or the individual <coughs> acting within an institutional training or framework, that one of the things that I perhaps was losing sight of, the institution was losing sight of, was the content of the work. And that it was really important to regard the content of the work rather than these questions of location, questions of place. This, this might have been how I arrived, but um, when, I, um, when I met the other people who were involved, who came from Rwanda, Uganda, uh, Zimbabwe, um, the, there was a Polish uh, person living in Uganda, and one American, it was very clear that the, the idea of wanting to engage in institutional discussion um, or talk about the work of the artist in, a, in Africa, there was, there was still quite a strong interest in Western institutions. So that while Clementine in 1995 describes this idea about going to the place of the art, when in 2014 I arrived in, in, in Africa, we're still talking about um, the Western institutions that Africa has either imposed on itself or has had imposed on it. So what became very important was this idea of the definitions. Now Salah Hassan reading contemporary here makes the point that there is a division in Africa between the ideas around traditional arts and um, indigenous arts and the contemporary. Um, he, he makes a point in here, Susan Vogel has mentioned it here, you see Hatha Dan Senghara, recent scholarship on contemporary African culture has demonstrated that Africa's encounter with the West has been far more complex than previously thought. Now again, remember there were models like the triangle uh, um, approach to Africa, which was to bring institutions <coughs> throughout Africa by the, the ex-colonizers to try and invest in the African artistic uh, structure. And that would be a little apart and possibly a little, not discredited, but questioned at this point. But um, African assimilation of Western techniques, materials, ideas and forms has been creative, selective, meaningful and highly original. The result has been a continuous recreation of forms and styles in short. Africa's creative impulses remain alive and continue to contribute great works. A little further on, they say the colonizing structure has resulted in a dichotomizing system with a great number of paradigmatic oppositions. Traditional versus modern, oral versus written, and printing. Agrarian and customary communities versus urban industrialized civilizations. Subsistence economies versus highly productive economies. And it's important to notice that modernity itself is a European construct that was initially articulated while traditional Africa was being colonized. So the, the interfaces about modernity and contemporary and the indigenous and the traditional in the discussions that we were having in the ICI uh, uh, grouping in Addis Ababa were confusing for, for me. I had thought I was going back to Africa. It was made very clear to me when I arrived that I was, I had been only ever in colonial Africa. I'd only ever, I'd been born in a place that now no longer existed. 
So I was, if you like, an observer, but there was a, a confusion for me in what I was hearing, which was based in a, an extremely interesting traditional um, Eliasim uh, house that had been made with traditional works. With all of these people who were engaged in African uh, art in, um, uh, work, but we talked Biennales, we talked the enormous colonizer, the Tate. We talked about the Alliance Française, the Gulf Institute, the British Council, how important all those funders are to getting anything done. We talked about festivals that corresponded to the kind of festivals we have here. We talked about representation of the Venice Biennale. And I found this to be, for me, <coughs> Uh, a, a really confused uh, presentation of um, unresolved issues. And really, in thinking about this, I wondered <coughs> whether the issue isn't about um, the institution and whether it's a Western institution or an African institution, but it might be just about the institution of contemporary art itself. And that while we, talk, we talked about how you know, funding was important and how the structure of the opening or the idea of the launch or whatever, it could have been happening anywhere. The underlying thing seemed to be that um, contemporary art in its iteration, whether it was in Limerick or whether it was in Galway or whether it was in Addis Ababa or um, Uganda, um, that actually it was really a very heavy construct to try and shift and conformity within that institution was very heavy and very um, it, it didn't really admit much change or variation now I mean I don't have any answers about this at this point but it made me realize that we're all working in a in a, a sort of a scenario where we're interrogating things and I suppose we need to look at art as one of those constructs within contemporary art, literally, where we live, where actually definitions are fluid, where the, um, the beginning and end starts, modernism starts in Africa a lot later than it would have done for us, but it's very distinct. Um, but the, the idea would be that actually when you go to Dakar, when you go to Senegal, <coughs> when you go to any of these new biennales, they are uh, really pushed into a framework which is very similar to any other Biennale or any other place that you go to. Now, is this necessarily a bad thing? I, I don't know, but it, it seems that it is about contemporary art and less about the, the context or the place that, we're, that we, were, we were in or wanted to go to when we wanted to go in 1994, as Clinton de said there, to Africa. Um, as usual, you go to Addis Ababa, but you can't leave um, the west of Ireland behind because Raphael um, <coughs> Chukukwa, um is the uh, chief curator at the National Gallery of Harare. And when I was introduced to him, he said, oh yes, I, I know Claire very well. He had spent some time in the west of Ireland and knew, knew the, the Limerick City Gallery of Art very well. But he also had been the chief curator of the Venice Biennale for Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Pavilion. <coughs> and um, he was very keen on Venice and uh, that showcase as showing how African art, if you like, has, has um, uh, progressed. And that the, the, ne the necessity to be at present at that as a national pavilion was was very strong. However, within this, uh, from his article, um, Creating Contemporary African Art, he um, talks about the diaspora for Africa as being problematic and perhaps the, 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 those who most misunderstand Africa. And then the idea that Africans, it's very last, Africans must narrate themselves and must not be a mere stagehand, be mere stagehands in a ventriloquist show. 
And while Raphael, uh, he is very um, passionate about all this, at the heart of it, he does see um, the Western constructs as a place where Zimbabwe must uh, engage in order to get a credibility. He also has a gallery which is so tied to understandings around the British colonial past. Uh, they haven't read. They haven't. I'm like, Andrea Fraser's, but they haven't renamed their galleries. They're still the Courtauld Gallery. They're still the, the sort of the National Gallery construct of the the Salisbury um, Ian Smith era. And I think that there is a kind of confusion around um, around different Africas. No different to how we we feel. I'm sure in terms of um, where Ireland fits in and the struggle to fit in and the need for institutions to recognise us and uh, validate us. But I suppose for <coughs> someone like me arriving at this place of inquiry, I had expectations and the expectations were something of looking for revelation, of something new and something different or the idea that an institution in, uh, in Africa would be different. Now, for me, therefore, the institution that emerged from this exam, and this very beginning of the examination, was that uh, the institutions are contemporary art, contemporary colonization, contemporary terminology, and contemporary curation. Now, during this gathering in Addis, uh, there was an artist. There were several artists present. Um, one of them from Washington, kind of said to me, uh, and again in the context of, of being in Addis Ababa, which hadn't been colonized, uh, Ethiopia hadn't been colonized, she said, I never really understood, it. what's the problem exactly between the UK and Ireland? Why don't you all just kind of get along? And it was really interesting because actually Ireland just didn't feature. They weren't that interested in Ireland. Suddenly the axis between Limerick and Addis Ababa looked a little bit tenuous because they probably didn't know where Ireland was in the main, but they also had no, no real reason to connect. And I thought that was interesting, no real curiosity, because of course I kept talking about we were colonized too. That didn't go down really great, actually. Um, which I was disappointed about. Um, kept trying to wave my flags. Not that interesting. Um, and the, the idea of contemporary curation, the, there was another artist called Tracy Rose. I don't know if you know Tracy's work, but I'll just show a, a little bit of her next. But while Raphael and a number of the others were talking about working with the Venice Biennale, working with Documenta or Manifesto, and all these huge institutions, she suddenly outbursts, she I'm sick of this. Why can't we uh, think differently? And she had actually been included in um, the main Venice Biennale, but uh, um, she's an interesting artist. But she, she lambasted on all of the super curators that came out of Africa as perpetuating the idea of a monolithic Africa, the idea that um, you can have an African pavilion at the Venice Biennale when actually this is written down when little places like Wales and Ireland have their own separate pavilions. And we have like a little gesture over there for, for Africa. So um, Tracy was very interesting because for me it was a little bit of uh, a help, a revelation if you like, that she wanted to talk about the art, she wanted to talk about the content and she wanted to uh, ha have a discussion less about the structures and less about the institutions and more about the, um, the, the work that artists were making. So one of her pieces, the Hottentot Venus here, uh, has been widely exhibited and included in exhibitions um, throughout Europe and America. And this is Tracy recreating uh, the Sarah, the name is there, Sartie Bartman, who was a Hottentot uh, um, native who was brought to Europe as an object of curiosity. And she recreated the notion of this Hottentot Venus in the bush, in the African uh, <coughs> um, arena or habitat 
Um, another work of hers there is a still from um, Waiting for God, this uh, major exhibition but also major work where she, she just basically, she's a performance artist as well as um, makes films, but she asks to confront the content very viscerally and extremely, she's very present as part of, she herself is part of that dialogue and part of that confrontation, but it, it is unavoidable to talk, you can't talk just about Africa when you talk about Tracy's work. It is gender politics at its most uh, uh, strident and demanding. It is about issues that we would deal with here in terms of the workforce exclusions, those people who are marginalized. And it was a very powerful, um, uh, it is very powerful work around what kind of work Africa can bring to us. But essentially, who here in this room would know Tracy Rose? She's actually a very well-known African artist, but we still have that problem of knowing between Africa who does what and what do we look for in the exhibitions here. She actually <laughs> agreed to come to Limerick, but in, in fact, I'm not there anymore, but perhaps somewhere else. But um, in finishing, um, I was recently at the Judith Bus Judith Butler uh, talk in Dublin, and it's really nice to see this power institution um, iteration completely full and oversubscribed. In Trinity, when Judith Butler was speaking, there were about a thousand people queuing around the block, couldn't get in. Um, well, I was one of the luckier ones into the um, lecture theatre that was being streamed to from the other lecture theatre. And part of that discussion was around um, vulnerability and resistance and how they're equated in terms of um, making a change, making a difference. Uh, she's, if, I'm, if I understood correctly, she's saying that vulnerability and resistance are uh, inextricably linked and that in fact perhaps vulnerability is a, uh, a precondition for resistance but also when infrastructure uh, becomes um, precarious. So if you take Greece, when the post offices don't work, when the banks don't give out, when nothing works, that that creates a huge vulnerability and that um, that is a necessary precondition for this protest or for this, uh, this resistance. And I wonder, she talked about actual materi uh, uh, material infrastructure. And I found when I finished in Africa for that short period, and it's part of a, an ongoing project that, that I have, which is around um, the impact of globalization in, in, uh, and the landscape of globalization with Addis and Dublin and Havana. And um, the, the idea that the physical infrastructure indicates change is one thing, but there is also an internal in, conceptual infrastructure, if you like, in the individual within institutions that when you do feel vulnerable and you do feel that things are missing, perhaps I thought like that in exhibitions in Limerick, which is possibly one of the reasons why now I'm not working in exhibitions for the moment. But it is a time for examining, I think, the sites within oneself of uh, both crisis, of institutionalization, but also of curation. And as a curator, I think there's a there is a, a need for contemporary curating to take responsibility for maybe these institutional issues. I think that's the end of that.